Hi everyone, my name is Jeff Starr and this is my channel Not Bad Films. I make videos about music. Today I'm going to be talking about the five things you need to know if you are thinking about learning the sitar. This is a video that I wish had been available when I started my journey taking sitar lessons and trying to learn this instrument. So hopefully this is helpful for anyone who wants to learn this instrument and is debating whether or not they should do it or how hard is it. So I'm going to sort of give you a lot of just basic information so that you can get started on that journey or not get started on that journey because you realize it's maybe not the right thing for you or it is the right thing for you. <laughs> I want to make a quick disclaimer up front in that I will be using some sitars that were sent to me by Old Delhi Music, which is a Indian music store located in Urbana, Illinois. They specialize in harmoniums, but they also carry instruments like sitars. Uh, I've been very happy with them. I really like the team at Old Delhi Music, but they're not pay me and they're not influencing me to to say anything nice about them. I would certainly let you know if I wasn't happy because, you know, it's my reputation is involved as well. So, but I like the team there and I think they will take care of you if you're looking to um, purchase an instrument. So now to the topic at hand, these five things that I think that you should know. And, and number one, <laughs> number one, there are various styles of sitars. And this is something I actually didn't know when I wanted to start learning the sitar. And they, they relate to the style of music that you're going to, to uh, learn to play. This is sort of similar to like a guitar. You might have a, a classical acoustic guitar. You might have a, a jazz arch top. You might have a uh, super slick um, guitar for playing heavy metal and, and legato licks and all that stuff. And you might have a different guitar for, for traditional like Americana or blues or something like that. So just like you wouldn't pick up your classical acoustic guitar and try to play heavy doom metal on it, and, and you could, and it might be really kind of interesting to listen to, but if you were trying to specifically play overdriven, loud rock and roll, that guitar wouldn't be suitable. So of these two styles of sitar, they're the first that I'll talk about um, was made famous by Ustad Vilayat Khan. Ustad Vilayat Khan is from the Imdad Khani Garana. Uh, sometimes this is also called the Atawa Garana. A Garana is sort of the, the lineage of a specific musical uh, family. And all this doesn't literally mean specifically a, a father-son relationship. In this case, um, Imdad Khan is Ustad Vilayat Khan's grandfather. The type of sitar that you would use for this style of performance is generally would be a Gandahar Pancham sitar. And this refers to um, the way the strings are tuned. And um, Gandhar just relates to Ga, which is one of the names of in Indian classical music for the notes. Generally, there's, there is um, a gourd on this side, but there's no upper tumba. On, on the on the top here, it has l less strings, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, and also, the the really defining characteristic is um, the bridge here. In this case, this is uh, ebony. Sometimes they're they're bone. It doesn't have to be ebony for this style, but um, it's a little bit more mellow. So if you think of a sitar as being very buzzy and 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 um, that sort of sound, let's say. Um, this is a little more subdued in that regard, although it still has the sympathetic strings underneath. Um, and the, the bridge, this jawari, it's called the sort of arc of the bridge that causes that buzzing. It's a little bit flatter. And in the style of performance, there's, there's, and this is not to be exclusive to this style, but there's perhaps more of a focus on, on the bending of the strings for a sort of singing more like vocal quality. And I, I'm very cautious to say that that is, you know, how this style is known because of course that happens everywhere across Indian classical music and in, in the next style I'll talk about. But I'm trying to simplify this for, for anyone who's sort of new. These instruments are usually tuned a little bit higher in pitch. Uh, D is very common. That's not ex required. It could be tuned lower, but in my experience, Something around um, D is very normal. So this would be a Gantar Pancham style sitar um, or in a Ustad Vilayat Khan style instrument. So this next style of sitar would be what would be played by Ravi Shankar. And, and of course, if you 
know anything about the sitar, you probably know Ravi Shankar's name. Of course, his, his connection to the Beatles and sort of being a cultural icon in the, in the 60s. This, this would be the style of, of instrument that he would have played. And this would be referred to as a Karaj Pancham. Uh, this instrument is named as such because it has two additional bass strings, um, which I don't think I'm in tune here. <laughs> Those two additional bass strings um, allow this instrument to play lower in the scale of the raga you're, you're performing. If my memory serves me correct, Ravi Shankar had those strings added to his instrument because he wanted to carry over some of the lower range of an instrument called the Surbahar, which is sort of like a bass sitar. And so he had added these lower strings to allow him to play lower in the, the alap portion of the raga, the, the opening portion. Those two strings have, there's little hooks here, and you can sort of hook those strings and mute them um, when you're playing sort of the faster passages. This instrument, beyond having the extra strings, generally has a um, second gourd at the top of the neck here. That changes the balance of the instrument. Um, it does change the tone a bit. These two instruments, by the way, that Old Delhi sent me are made by Naeem Sitar Maker. The fit and finish on these are, are really nice and clean and sharp. Um, that's been, been great, that everything fits really well. Tuning pegs uh, are matched really nicely to the body. Um, these are just sort of, on a sitar, it's a friction peg, so it's just it's a the pe it's just stuck in the hole and you turn it and it holds by friction. Overall, I've been I think these are very nice instruments. This Ravi Shankar um, style or this Mahar Garana that would be the the Garana that he would be a part of. I'm just gonna generalize. Ravi Shankar for himself I think is really renowned for his his rhythmic play that he does. He he has a background as a dancer. I like to say that I think that carried over into the way he he plays his instrument. It's very fast and, and dancing-like um, and sort of light, light on the toes. Um, and of course, a, a true master, an incredible musician, um, without a doubt. I mean, I, certainly the, the, the legacy he leaves is, is tremendous. Um, within the My Heart Garana, maybe less focused on some of the, the singing vocal qualities, but that's not to say that it's not there. And it's not to say that other performers within that um, Garana don't um, include that and perhaps include that to a very high level. Um, so there's a, this is a, this, these aren't definitive lines. They're very much blending. Um, I think the bigger thing you need to know is this instrument goes lower and it's also buzzier. So the bridge is more, what we would say open. And so it has more buzzy, more sort of traditional sitar sound that you might think of because of course, most of the Indian classical music you might have been exposed to or the sound that you would have heard on like pop albums or something um, would be maybe more this type of instrument. Also, I recently shot a video specifically for this type of sitar to demonstrate how it is tuned. Um, there are a lot of things in that video that of course apply to, to both styles of instruments, um, but I did it specifically for this. I also have a video tuning a Atawa Garana or Ustad Valaya Khan style instrument. That's an older video on, on my own personal instrument, not on the ones by Old Delhi, but I did just shoot a video um, featuring this and tuning this and sort of going through that process. So if you want to get a sense of what's involved in tuning your instrument, um, that does exist. And then finally, this instrument is generally tuned C sharp, um, perhaps even C. Ravi Shankar would have had his instrument in C sharp generally. So it's a little bit also lower, half step lower than um, the Valaya Khan style, which would be in D. Another thing you should know about this uh, Ustad Valaya Khan style sitar is it's generally a little bit plainer in its decoration. Um, see if you can see it there. So it's not as um, super fancy. So usually some has a darker stain. Um, just visually, it's, it's, it's not as ornate. That doesn't mean that it's it's not as nice as this Mahar Grana or Ravi Shankar style. This has much more decoration, right? It's a little more ornate. The level of decoration is also not a hard and fast rule. So uh, there may be a Ravi Shankar style, there may be a Ravi Shankar style sitar that is less ornate and thus costs less money. On the Ustad Valaya Khan, same deal. There can be even less ornate than it's already less ornateness and it'll also cost less money, or it could be even more ornate and um, 
just be because someone wanted it that way. So, you know, we buy, sometimes we like the way things look. So I just want you to know that, <laughs> you know, I've sort of given you sort of a rough description about how these styles might vary. What you really want to do though, is go and listen to performances of these two Garanas. I'll put some links in the descriptions to some performances that I think are good examples. The differences between these are, should be really of less importance in the long run, but it's something you should know before you go and be begin this journey. Number two, <laughs> find a teacher. Do not try to teach yourself. This is um, something that I, I really want to stress. I, there are a lot of videos on my channel of me sort of documenting my journey of learning the instrument and videos like this where I might try to um, explain some of the basic fundamentals of Indian classical music or the sitar or some early exercises I was learning or how to tune your instrument, like I said. But those videos are, are not designed to be a learning course for you to learn how to play the instrument. This started to me as a way to just, hey, I want to make some videos for YouTube. And I'll just, even it's really even for myself so that I could go back and go like, hey, look, I got better. <laughs> and people sort of responded to those. And I realized that what I could do, if it is very small thing to add to um, th this instrument, is to encourage people to study it and learn it and to, to, um, to find a teacher and, and spend time like actually trying to learn this instrument. I think it's a great instrument. I love Indian classical music. And um, so this is something that I really wanna make clear though. Like if you don't find a real teacher, you're never gonna learn. And th this is about, um, this is really important. Like figure out which style you like, find a teacher that teaches in that style. And you know, it's 2021. The last uh, <laughs> year has been kind of crazy and everyone's online. And there are a lot of people, very, very qualified people from my guru to many others who are teaching Indian classical music online that you can go to, to learn from. So now hopefully you know, hey, I like this sort of Garana, perhaps a little bit more than another, or I don't care um, which Garana it is. And that's maybe the better way to think. So instead, now go and find a teacher. Don't go out and buy an instrument and then try to find a teacher. Find a teacher and find a teacher who inspires you to practice a teacher who, who communicates to you and teaches you in the way that you need to learn and someone who you have that proper um, sort of balance or chemistry or whatever you want to say that you want to see them every week and pick their brain and take a lesson and, and learn from them and absorb from them. And as you're learning from them, one of the probably the first things you'll ask is what type of instrument should I get? Where should I get my instrument? You probably don't need to start with a super expensive instrument. I didn't. I started on a on a cheaper instrument um, and worked my way up to my um, Brun Roy instrument that I have now. Number three, where to buy your instrument? Don't buy it on eBay. Don't buy it on Amazon. Talk to a teacher like I, I previously mentioned, right? <laughs> mentioned it one more time. Uh, there are other many reputable uh, dealers online and I can list some of those in the description. Old Deli is the only one I've dealt with directly. And of course they, they've sent me the instruments to use in this video so they get a little bit of a plug there. Number four is expectations. This is really important. So expectations. A sitar has a lot of strings and a lot of tuning pegs. These instruments are also handcrafted. Now these Naeem sitar maker sitars, I think are, are pretty good. They're, they're 
really nicely made. But it's still old, old school sort of technology, right? It's it's wood that's hollow with wood pegs that are just held on by the friction. Maybe there's a little chalk to help them hold and turn. Humidity changes this instrument a lot. Um, the bridge is just sort of affixed here through the pressure of the strings pushing down. The, the body is made out of a super fragile gourd. Pumpkin's not like a common building material these days, right? If you want to play the sitar, you're going to have to spend time just learning to take care of your instrument, do maintenance on it. If you want to practice, you're going to have to set time aside to make sure you tune your instrument in advance. Certainly if you have a, a very cheap instrument, um, you're really going to struggle. If you have a nicer instrument like these or, or the Barun Roy instrument I have, um, maybe less so. Although ironically, although I prefer my Barun Roy, which is this instrument way in the back here, I, I prefer prefer that because that's the one I know the most and I've, I've played it the most. It's um it's the one I struggle the most with like with the, some of those things right like getting everything tuned. It's it's got more wear. It's it's you know some of these little um, string guides have cracked and stuff, and so if strings catch in them. So there's like you just have to have expectations. Like it's not you're not buying like a brand new top of the line PRS guitar off the shelf that's super over engineered for like perfection. You know these are handcrafted instruments uh, made one at a time, and they have variances as a result. They have a lot of character as a result. You have to know that going in. Another expectation you need to have going in is that the music theory for Indian classical music is really complicated. Of course, shares some similarities to maybe Western music theory, but it also shares the things not at all, <laughs> right? You have different names for the notes. You have different concepts of, of just tuning where the notes lie. Phrasing is different. There's, there's all these subtleties and rules to how you perform a raga. It's not jazz. Right? Not to say that jazz doesn't have rules, but you know, if you think about you have a blues progression and then you might play sort of a specific box pattern on your guitar over that, or in jazz you might play over the changes to the song and 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 look at the different modes within your playing. Um, in Indian classical music, there are no chords. You're you're playing in in the the saw that has been determined by your instrument or the who you're playing with you're now going to play a raga that has a set of rules let's say you use these notes you don't use these notes you approach these notes in this order and you descend in this order and and you might have these common phrases and you might stress this note more than another and this note you might almost barely never play <laughs> right there's just a lot of things to absorb it's not about listening to a recording and trying to just copy that performance or learning to have your, you know, your teacher might first have you started with exercises, but you're, you need to understand why you're doing that exercise. And you might not for a long time. Your teacher might just say, just play this, build up hand strength for a while. And then we're going to do that for a long time <laughs> with only one raga. You might not learn a bunch of ragas at first. You might only learn one and then begin to open that up to begin to do other things and that might be a long process because things that you think you might understand, you might not. <laughs> like vibrato doesn't really exist in Indian classical music. There's similar things. Bending or meaned is a, a different sort of concept in a lot of ways. There's, of course, crossover, but there's, there's things that are different. And you need to have an open mind and be willing to unlearn a lot of stuff to learn it and struggle for a long time and go, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and then um, maybe have a light bulb go off. There's also no written music. There's been attempts at doing written notation for Indian classical music and for the sitar in particular. Um, Ravi Shankar has done this in a couple of his books so that people can sort of have an understanding. It's primarily, it's taught as an oral tradition and you need to hear it and put it all up in here and be able to think of it that way. And that can be difficult if you're used to setting up some sheet music and going like, here's what I'm going to play. You need to practice a lot. The sitar is 
both incredibly difficult uh, to play. It's sometimes also really easy. When I was first thinking about learning the sitar, I was like, oh my goodness, there's so many strings. It's like playing some sort of weird, crazy, you know, seven string guitar harp or something. And then I watched a couple of videos and I was like, oh, the fretting is just played on one string and the other strings sort of chime along and drone along with that. And I was like, oh, well, I can do that. <laughs> and I could, but fretting that string is really painful for a long time, especially if you don't already have like a sense of playing the guitar or something. And even now as someone who's, who's been playing for a long time, it's still painful. There's times where I just, I can't have to cut my practice session short because my hand just physically hurts, right? And to that point about practice, it may take you a long time before you have something that your friends and family go like, oh, that sounds like a song, right? It may just sound like an out of tune mess for a while, or it may sound just like you may have really bad tone for a while. Just getting a pleasing sound out of your instrument. It may be very nasally or, or plinky or, or you may not have a really great instrument to start with. And so the, the physical instrument itself might not be able to produce a, a great sound. So you have to know that this is like a journey. And if you get hooked on it, like I did, um, it's sort of go with the flow one day at a time and just chip away at trying to get as good as you can. But just know that that's not going to probably happen overnight. As you get more involved in learning about Indian classical music, there's going to be a whole bunch of other things you need to unlock. Stuff about culture, about visual arts, um, language, to have a better understanding of this music that you're trying to learn. I thought I knew like, hey, I know about the sitar and I, know, I have these Ravi Shankar albums and I know what I'm doing <laughs> when I first started. <laughs> and I knew like nothing. Uh, everything I thought I knew was ultimately not, not the case. Um, I didn't know the basics of the different lineages or the different styles. I didn't really know what a raga was. I thought I did. I had no idea. And those are like core concepts that I'm trying to like expose you to, uh, whoever you are, who's watching this <laughs> high person. Just know that like you got to be always learning and you got to be like excited to be learning to prevent yourself from plateauing. I think like most things you hit a plateau, you, you hey, I learned a bunch of stuff and then you sort of like flatline for a while and I certainly got stuck in a plateau trying to learn more uh, about these other aspects that made me sort of go like, oh, now I get this thing that I thought I got, but now I realize I didn't. <laughs> That's maybe a bad example, but I think you get the idea. And the final expectation I want you to know is that if, if you're thinking about like, I'm just going to buy a sitar and I'll teach myself a little bit because I want to put a little sitar on um, some like recording I'm doing or, you know, I think it'd be just like cool to have or whatever. I don't, don't buy a sitar, right? I think you're going to spend a, a fair amount of money on something that ends up collecting dust and maybe you sell it down the road. I don't know. I think you would be better off with one of two options uh, and those would be a sitar guitar. So this is a guitar. It has a, a bridge here that, that does sort of a buzzy Jawari thing. It has some sympathetic strings. Um, and it's still just a regular guitar that you can fret and play chords and solo on and, and woo, right? Um, a lot of fun. I really like these just to layer into recordings when you just want a little extra something special. You hear these all over the place. Now that I have one of these, I hear it in recordings all the time. Number two would be something like this. This is the uh, Ravish Sitar made by Electroharmonics. This is a digital pedal to create a um, sitar effect for your guitar. I bought this because I thought I'll make a video where I put a sitar through this sitar emulator and we'll see what happens, but I haven't made that video yet. <sighs> it's not like the greatest thing. It's very digital sounding to me. I think it sounds better if you split it into stereo, you put the drone strings in one amp and, and sort of the sitar main string in another. They, whoever built this though, did a lot of really good research um, as to how you would actually want to set this up to tune your guitar, to play in various ragas. It's really smartly designed. It's pretty complicated, but it still sounds a little, you know, it doesn't sound like a sitar. It sounds like a digital sitar, but it's still a lot of fun. But let's say you have something like a sitar guitar 
but now you're like gonna play live. This could sort of fill that gap or you just want this to mess around with to do some cool fun stuff with. Like mess around, do some cool fun stuff. That's a fun pedal, but you know, it's, you know, it's, you're not gonna use it for everything, but it's, I mean, I own one. <laughs> And my fifth thing in my list of stuff you should know before you decide to learn the sitar is what is my biggest regret about learning the sitar? The thing that I wish I had known and I really regret the most. Having been a student and a student that struggles, oh, I think I struggle a lot, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I don't struggle that much. But a student that struggles to learn this music and to understand it and to get better like I certainly hit a plateau and I've really coasted there and and that has become really discouraging for me and there's times where I just like felt like I'm not this is just not gonna work for me and I just like stopped playing for a while and that's not cool right that's like a loss of like time and time is the big regret that I didn't start sooner maybe that sounds cheesy right but there's like there's this saying about planting a tree right the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago and the second best time to plant a tree is today. And that's sort of how I feel a little bit about the sitar and probably anything you want to do in life if you want to learn something. The sooner you start, the better. When I was wanting to learn this instrument, I like debated it for a long time. I thought about, oh, would this be fun? Eh. And the, YouTube wasn't like a thing really. I, I don't, it was maybe a newish thing. I don't know. <laughs> and certainly there wasn't as much information available online. Although I'd even found my my guru in New York, I'd found his website. I like looked him up and thought about it. I never like even reached out to him or, or to ask about lessons. I think I ended up waiting like two years. Um, and there's a separate video where I sort of tell this story, but I'll simplify it. That's two years that I could have been learning. That's the thing I would tell you. Do I regret learning sitar? No. Do I wish I'd started it sooner? Yes. Do I wish I'd started two years sooner? Yes. Do I wish I'd started 10 years sooner? Yes. Do it. If you want to do it, do it. If you've made it this far in the video, you probably want to do it, right? <laughs> so go through the list, right? Figure out which type of Indian classical music you like, you're sort of driven or attracted to. Find a teacher that you connect with. Figure out how you're going to get an instrument. Make sure you have really clear expectations of what your journey is going to be like. It's going to be painful at first. <laughs> it might be really not sounding good for a little while. And then you'll have a big jump and then you might plateau. And then you got to keep fighting <laughs> to keep learning and don't give up. So there you go. So those are my five things I think you should know if you want to learn the sitar. I do want to thank Nick Dillon over at Old Delhi Music for sending me these two instruments. This has been really amazing to have this opportunity to, to feature these and get to play just more types of instruments. Um, I, I really like these, they're really well constructed. And um, so thank you again for that. And if you like this video, there's, there's a lot more like this on my channel. So please do check those out. And if you really like what I'm doing, I do have a Patreon page where you can um, help support me making more content like this. All right, that's, that's it for now. Thank you so much for watching and uh, happy practicing.